Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Insin 360 podcast, the podcast that takes a deep dive into metabolic health. I'm your host, Joe, and for this episode, I've got the second half of an interview that I did with Marek Doyle, who's a functional nutritionist based in London in the UK. So in the first half, we talked about some of the reasons why people's metabolic health starts to decline. In this half, we're talking about some of the solutions that Marek uses in practice. So if you haven't already watched that first half, I highly suggest you go and um, take a look. Um, yes, in this episode, we're going to get into more depth about the ketogenic diet. So we're talking about when it may be appropriate, when it may not be appropriate, and how we can actually tell if we're actually in ketosis or not. Um, some of the measurements we can do, but also some of the common signs and symptoms. We'll also be talking about some of the common uh, issues that people may come up against when starting out on their keto journey, and particularly uh, some issues to do with what happens when uh, they may respond negatively to the reintroduction of, of carbohydrates after some time doing keto. We then move forward to talk about some of the more common uh, herbs that Marek uses in practice and when they may or may not be appropriate. And in a more broader sense, talking about evidence-based medicine and statistical science, when they may be of benefit, and but when also they may be problematic if we don't take into account the context and all of the other things going on for that particular individual. So one small correction, when we're talking about the keto diet, I compare it to a uh, low fat diet. I actually meant to say low carb diets because there's a difference there. So when we're talking about keto, we're generally talking about an even lower carb diet um, where it initiates this uh, ketogenesis process. And that's generally below 50 grams of carbs uh, a day. Uh, but of course, as we get into the, um, the episode, as Marek states, this depends from person to person and on their own particular situation. So with that said, if you'd like to know more about Marek, then head on over to his website, marekdoll.com. If you want to know more about, uh, about Insulin360, you can subscribe here on YouTube or head over to the website and join the newsletter. So with that said, let's get on with the episode. I think it's the right tool for the right time, just like with insulin being used in the right place at the right time. Also, um, obviously, modern medicine has its place. If I'm in a car crash, I, I want to be going to a hospital and, and be getting uh, attention, obviously. <laughs> exactly. But if I've got some sort of chronic metabolic dysfunction um, that is um, due to my lifestyle, stress, circadian rhythms, diet, relationships, and so on, it's clear that I'm going to have to take quite a radically different approach. So that moves us on to perhaps some of the solutions and perhaps one of the most radically different approaches that uh, has come about in the last few decades and really taken, um, taken uh, got very popular in the last uh, few years is the ketogenic diet. So, um, of course, we've talked about um, the organic acids test as being able to identify some of perhaps the drivers of potential insulin issues and a whole load more as well, like endotoxemia, mitochondrial dysfunction, and so on. Um, and we've talked about the importance of uh, being aware of um, perhaps maintaining circadian rhythms, getting sunshine, uh, eating a nutrient rich diet, or at least an unprocessed diet. Uh, or minimally processed, um, and of course, the danger of overeating, sedentary lifestyle, those are all kind of the general things that that we would uh, say to people in this situation. But then, uh, so ketogenic diet, um, to my mind, represents a, a really powerful tool when people are in that, uh, that place, I would imagine. I don't know. So um, perhaps you could... Um, uh, tell me, what, what, what is a ketogenic diet? How do we define it? So a ketogenic diet is actually quite easy to define. Uh, it is one that produces a state of nutritional ketosis measured by having blood ketone levels, of BHB, beta hydroxybutyrate, between 0.5 and 3 nanomoles per litre. That's how I would define it. So, And that is important to recognise because... There are hugely dogmatic positions taken when it comes to the ketogenic diet, ranging from the evangelical call for all humans to adopt this diet as the one true ultimate diet that best suits humans, 
but also, yeah, those that say, oh, it's a you know, dangerous starvation state. Um, and I've heard medical doctors uh, say that. Uh, so, yeah, the key thing there is that a lot of people who have introduced uh, a diet to achieve ketosis have never had ended up achieving ketosis. I actually kept a log between 2015 and 2017 of individuals who came to see me who were already on a ketogenic diet, or at least perceived that they were on a ketogenic diet, and 19 out of 20 were not in nutritional ketosis. So it's difficult to say, you know, how does that extrapolate to the wider population? Because you know, here are some individuals who, by definition, are more likely to have metabolic issues, but also are more likely and have demonstrated your commitment to trying to go beyond simply casual dietary trials. They are committed to, uh, yeah, doing things properly by, by definition. You don't spend the money to do the testing and on the appointment fees, etc. unless you're committed. So yeah, how does that extrapolate? Not sure, but nonetheless, we can be pretty confident that people who say, I tried the ketogenic diet, I was just hungry all the time, my sleep was ruined. Well, being hungrier on the ketogenic diet is possibly the single most reliable sign that you are not in ketosis because of the way that ketones do have such a reliable and noticeable effect on reducing appetite. And sure. I think that's one of so the you've, problems um, that run into in that they don't eat enough, but that's by the sure. by. So you've been running on, on uh, sugar for many years um, and then you switch over ke to um, a ketogenic diet where that sugar is removed. Um, and then you're going to have difficulty in actually turning those um, substrates into ketones and using them or even from burning fatty acids. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess, yes, it's Im important probably to lay out that, um, okay, so different tissues of the body are going to be preferring different substrates and the advantage perhaps of the ketogenic diet would be that the brain can't use fatty acids. So it can either use uh, glucose or ketones or also lactate and other substrates mm -hmm. like that. So um, is that the main difference between a low fat diet and a ketogenic diet then? The, well, yes, I mean, it, it the... would be the availability of the ketones because yeah, a lot of people will, um, yeah, undertake what they deem to be a ketogenic diet. And often it is a rehash of the Atkins diet, which if people were to take the advice pumped out in the seventies, um, and apply that, they may end up in ketosis, but they'll often not. A lot of people will consider the ketogenic diet as high fat, high protein, low carb. It is by definition moderate protein. And if people consume more protein than, than they want to be consuming, then that's going to have a reliable impact on the production of ketones. I've heard arguments against that. I would invite people to just test it themselves and see what they uh, see what they read on the on, on the monitors. But um, absolutely that. Um, so the key thing being that yeah, if somebody is not eating enough fat, or they're overeating proteins, or they are uh, measuring net carbs rather than just carbs. There's a high likelihood they're going to run into trouble. But the single biggest factor there to know what's going on is just measure the ketones and then we know. And so many people are stunned. Now, step number one, if you're not producing the ketones, is always going to be to look at that macronutrient split, that split between the carbs, the fats, the proteins. Um, but also it's worthwhile considering the stress response. If your system is under major stress, well, what is it going to do? It's going to pump out adrenaline exactly as it's evolved to do. What is the most important role of adrenaline? To spike your blood glucose. And this is where people often find that, I don't understand it. How can my blood glucose be that high? I'm on a ketogenic diet. This is after we actually go and measure it. And that's because you can source glucose from your diet absorb it through the gut or you can manufacture it from 
proteins. Proteins are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Get rid of that nitrogen, you've got yourself an emergency carbohydrate. This is this process that we see called gluconeogenesis, the making of new glucose. And yeah, if your system is pumping out all this adrenaline, which is, yeah, driving high levels of blood glucose, well, your liver is the site of ketone production. And if your liver is not uh, receiving sufficient fats because, hey, you're only eating 110 grams, because it feels like a high fat diet, even though most people will always struggle beneath 140 and often they'll benefit from substantially more. And on top of that, you've got high delivery of sugar to your, your liver. The likelihood of you producing the ketones you're after is nil. And so this is where, yeah, it, it is very important to just recognize, well, what obstacles might I have in producing the optimal ketones and tending to them ahead of time. But more often than not, just measure the ketones and then you'll know whether you need additional support, additional mm. compensation, or indeed, whether you're actually in ketosis. Sure. And I guess... This represents a particular challenge for people who are dealing with insulin resistance, particularly in the liver, because one of insulin's main roles in the liver is to put the brakes on gluconeogenesis. So if that signal is then getting through, and maybe they also have high glucagon at the same time, that gluconeogenic process is being stimulated, they're having constantly high blood sugars, and um, it's only really, I guess, going to improve when the liver improves in health and the, the fat reduces and it becomes more sensitive. So I guess the question is, um, how do you get over that initial hump? Because that period, I guess, could last for quite a while while things, um, while things improve. Yeah, and this is where if somebody is hyper mega stressed, I'm unlikely to recommend a ketogenic diet for this exact reason, because you're then asking their system to manufacture ketones at the time the liver is receiving this constant supply of glucose. So this is where we'd want to take a look into first taking those obvious steps that I mentioned uh, previously, and that may well focus on the adrenal activity that is to say do they have sufficient cortisol activity something that's vital for them, not only maintaining those blood sugar levels in the right zone so that you don't need a emergency dump of adrenaline to correct it but also for controlling inflammatory processes including those uh, processes that result in too much nitric oxide and so forth, the cellular hypoxia that I mentioned, that lack of oxygen delivery, which has devastating effects on the energy availability, but also the removal of food energy from the bloodstream, which we know is so vital for driving further insulin sensitivity. So that would be an example of some obvious first steps to help with uh, yeah, the, the cortisol activity, not only for those body related things, but equally for the feedback that provides to the hypothalamus to say, hey, the body's responded, chill your beans. And there's nothing more potent in reducing the stress response than adequate cortisol feedback, something that ironically tends to be compromised after sustained long term stress and that endotoxemia, which those endotoxins directly impair the uh, sensitivity of the cortisol receptors. So it's a very common thing to need to get on top of. Um, and that's something that in itself can make a massive difference to someone's ability to, yeah, maintain metabolic regulation. But most of all, it's going to give them a platform upon which they now have a fair chance of responding to the next interventions that are called for, whether that is dietary change of various varieties, whether that's the ketogenic diet, you know, whether that's any sort of protocol to actually switch on pathways that have been subdued, that's almost always going to be a, a baseline step that we'll want to take. We may also then want to deliberately enhance insulin sensitivity. And this is where we can look at 
gyno stemmer or cinnamon or chaga or some of the usual options that are, are reliable in those circumstances we can also take a look into uh yeah supporting nad levels and uh yeah that's where dietary manipulation or supplementation can play a role um and suddenly we've started to give them a fair chance but equally, the use of C8 oil is a very practical step. So C8 oil, also called caprylic acid, is a, a fatty acid that's extracted from coconut oil. About 6% of the coconut oil is found in the form of caprylic acid. And so the key thing is when you extract that, you can now exploit its properties, which have a huge benefit when it comes to the production of ketones. Normally, so that fats, would be one of the medium chain triglycerides, right? Yes, it is. So, yeah, MCTs. And so normally fats would be absorbed slowly through the gut, and then they would go through the lymphatic system, and then drop by drop, they would be released into circulation. It's an extremely slow process. But the medium chain triglycerides they go straight from the intestines to the liver so they actually don't have an opportunity to be used for other purposes to modify energy signal interact with whatever is going on there they go straight to the liver and provide this temporary imbalance between fat availability and glucose which is what we want when it comes to the production of ketones and those four enzymes at the liver that produce the ketones suddenly they are going to be deployed and so this is where we can skip the old school methods of transitioning to a ketogenic diet which was to deal with it uh deal with the carb cravings and the low energy and being cold all the time and sure. poor sleep and just feel so called uh, keto flu yeah, yeah, exactly. Which doesn't just relate to this low carb limbo state that I'm referring to, will often relate to our sodium and potassium status as well, may also relate to microbial die off if they were being sustained by a high availability of glucose in the intestines. But yes, um, keto flu, for the most part, is highly avoidable. Um, and C8 oil is one way through which we can help that transition. So, so this is where, yeah, uh, taking people with any energy metabolism issues, uh, energy metabolism issues, energy metabolism issues that might benefit from the ketogenic diet, there is still an important question to ask before thrusting them down that route, which is, is there likely to be a challenge? that will affect their ability to benefit from this approach and often there is so yeah taking some common sense steps tactically giving them a platform that means they've got more of a fair chance giving them that additional support in the form of c8 oil and suddenly they are now able to fuel themselves through ketones meaning that their system isn't stressed out by the lack of available fuel it doesn't need to lean on the pumping out of adrenaline to induce that gluconeogenesis we spoke of they don't need to suffer all those symptoms but they can now spend sustained time in a low insulin state allowing a change in what energy is stored in the various compartments of the liver suddenly that changes their insulin sensitivity suddenly we're actually seeing the protective down regulation of those receptors at various cells that is uh returned to a more optimal state and that's where we have reset a lot of those uh self-perpetuating cycles and yeah this is where the intelligent use the appropriate use rather than just a, a blanket use of the ketogenic diet can be a really useful, powerful tool uh, in clinic. Sure. Okay, great. And yes, I guess adding some of the other things we talked about as well, like um, proper circadian rhythm, stress management, and also maybe if somebody's been on a high carb diet for a long time, they're going to be low in carnitine and low in B vitamins, because that's, um, you know, not usually present in such high quantities in the kind of refined carb diets that people are usually on. So 
all of that together means that you can approach it in the right way and then you can actually get the benefits from it um, instead of just uh, coming up against a brick wall. Because this is what I've noticed with uh, a few of the cases I've seen is that uh, people have been um, burning glucose for so long that the kind of, uh, I don't know if it's, if it's, this is actually the case, and this is something I wanted to ask you, but it's almost like your muscles atrophy if you don't use them and the fat burning machinery atrophies a bit if you don't use it. Um, and so using some of these techniques, you can, you can um, get that online before uh, everything else comes offline. And so you're keeping your hypothalamus uh, hopefully reasonably happy. So um, yes, I'll ask you that what last question before we move on to some of the things which you see in, in uh, use in clinic um, is we often see that people who start a ketogenic diet, um, they then, um, some people report becoming uh, less tolerant to carbohydrates. So they stay on a ketogenic diet for a long time. Then they eat something which they would have eaten a while ago and suddenly they react in a, in a crazy way. So my question to you is, um, is the ketogenic diet, is it um, more of a palliative thing that just keeps insulin down or is it um, uh, more curative? And I think you alluded to that actually this with your previous answer that is able to reset a lot of that, uh, those vicious cycles that were going on before. And so if so, why is it that people get a kind of carb spike if they reintroduce low levels of carbohydrates when they're on a, a keto diet? Yeah, and so a lot of that can relate to what's going on in the gut. So if somebody has had um, a long-term ketogenic diet, then by definition, they're not going to be consuming lots of carbohydrates. Now, the interesting thing is that you can still consume a huge amount of fiber, which of course are technically carbohydrates, just the non-digestible form, um, and yeah, do so within the realms of a ketogenic diet. So this is where we're getting into the realms of dietary composition. How well is the diet put together? but also individual responses, individual vulnerabilities. So yes, if you have uh, a whole host of microbiome shifts that allow you to better metabolize fats versus uh, carbohydrates there, you know, what sort of opportunities does that present? There's no um, inevitable outcome there. There's plenty of individuals that I've spoken to who have used a ketogenic diet long term and noticed no such issues whatsoever. And some that have seen them without necessarily using the ketogenic diet for a long period of time. But nonetheless, yes, do we uh, expect to see a negative shift in the microbiome? Not necessarily, but it is one potential outcome depending on how the diet is constructed and depending on the uh, bacterial balance of that individual equally yeah what if there is issues for example with SIBO um would the return of higher levels of carbohydrates high levels of fiber suddenly flag that in a way that wasn't obvious before because of a whole variety of different challenges that made any detection of patterns difficult that's important too. Uh, but uh, yeah, equally, we might often see allergies, um, which, you know, if you happen to have a type B allergic reaction, aka an intolerance to, let's say, a grain, be that wheat or oats or anything that isn't included on a ketogenic diet, well, what are we going to see when we bring that back? And you know, what if there was uh, ongoing gluten issues that we'd never seen before? And this is where yeah, it's always important for us to ask the questions, well, what what unwanted shifts may well have occurred based on this exact intake? Um, equally, yeah, what is the actual cause? Um, is this more, you know, an incidental feature of some of the changes that we've made rather than it related to our aims itself? But uh, another thing worth sharing is that, yeah, these are scenarios where we 
definitely wouldn't want to look at, ah, oh, well, you just don't do well on carbs, so keto it is thereafter. If we're seeing a return of carbohydrates is, is driving some uh, metabolic challenges, well, then that tells us that something requires our attention. There is at least one important pathway that hasn't been given sufficient attention. So, yeah, that's where uh, sure. integrating that as a source of information would be step number one. Sure. Okay, great. So, yes, like we were said at the beginning, the aim is to get to a stage where we are metabolically flexible and so that we can take advantage of whatever is in our environment within reason uh, within reason uh, yeah yes avoiding perhaps uh, twinkies or um <laughs> cupcakes or whatever um but even then so i mean if you're metabolically flexible and you go out for a meal with your friends and you know once every so often you have a, a piece of cake or whatever then um if you're in a good state of health then you can also respond relatively well to that situation really? yeah, yeah sure. if you're on the beach in uh italy and uh yeah somebody offers you a gelato yeah far be it from me to say no to uh to that and this is where yeah if that is causing major issues well clearly that's a sign that as things stand it's probably worth avoiding but at the same time it's worth investigating as to why because yeah, that's clearly a sign that some attention somewhere is necessary. What attention? That's the question. Mm -mm. Sure. Okay, great. You've been very generous with your time, Marek. So um, I'll ask you a couple of quick things about uh, some of the things you mentioned before, the gynostemma, apple cider vinegar and, and, and cinnamon and so on. Um, so um, do you use those regularly, those things which you, you find... Uh, have have um have an impact yeah so i do end up recommending all of those semi-regularly the key thing being is when if there is a a state of chaos in the system we're never going to see anything meaningful for them however if we alternatively have stabilized a lot of these uh, major imbalances, we've actually engineered something resembling balance in the system, but there are still these obvious signs that energy metabolism needs a bit of support. Now, that's where we're likely to see distinct benefits from them. For example, yeah, is that something that individuals who are now feeling kind of sort of decent, but still subject to limitations well that's a time when yeah we may well want to make use of them and that's a time when i'd expect them to uh, have measurable impact so yeah very very useful when actually deployed alongside the the changes that we want to see sure great yes and it's so interesting to hear that because um uh what we sometimes forget when reading studies and looking at statistical data is that we miss the nuance of when these things can be useful or not. If a if a, a herb or supplement is useful in five cases out of a hundred, I mean life changing in those situations, then mm -hmm. it's good that we know about it and good that we know when to use it. But obviously, if you take that into a a large study, then that's not going to show any benefit. So um, the, the case well, being this is cinnamon, like we see example. it all the time. Yeah, if there is. Um... You know, you, you're measuring it up against a placebo. Well, you don't often need many people to pr provide a response if those that do respond are going to display a strong change. If that's the case, a, a small minority can create a statistically significant difference, which unfortunately is the only thing that most researchers are hunting for doesn't tell us when it's going to work, doesn't tell us who it's going to work in. But if we only get given two figures, the average response from this group, the average response from this group, it can't tell us, well, was that a mild response in 100% of them? Or was it a powerful response in 10%? Both are really relevant in that if you've got a powerful response from 10%, well, that tells us two things. One, 
there's a small minority of people that really could do with this intervention. It's going to do wonders for them. But there's also 90 percent who aren't going to benefit. Uh, so let's identify who is in which group, what markers can actually separate them so that we can start to give people the fair chance that they need instead of saying, well, this is proven to be helpful. Uh, if it doesn't work for you and you don't want to continue it, well, you're refusing treatment, um, which we see in the form of SSRIs, which you know, only work for one in eight people. It's, it's, it's very well established. Cochrane reviews, there's two of them which demonstrate the majority of people will not respond. One in eight will get a good response. Um, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, I guess it's because, um, uh, it's, uh, when we're looking at chronic disease, we're looking at a complex model. There are lots of different factors. You've gone into many of them here. And so, um, it depends on what type of person has the disease and not what type of disease has the person. So we're often looking for, uh, a protocol to apply something we can read online. Uh, something we can just use and it works for everybody and that's fine and we can wake up and feel great but um, it's not that simple so um, I really think that's a, a one of the main benefits that's come out of our talk today is that um, this move towards individualized medicine or individualized healthcare is not just a pipe dream it's something that actually needs to happen as um, our knowledge becomes more and more and as we understand to a better extent, the complexities of these systems, then we need to be able to apply different things to different people. And, and um, you know, the one size fits all is not working for, for, for many of these situations. It's just not. Um, and this is my major complaint with evidence based medicine. Um, and I'm bringing up my hands for that side because <laughs> So many people think that evidence-based medicine is the use of evidence in medicine, which of course is a good thing. You know, we see um, lots of nutritional therapists, people in my industry who will proudly stay on their website, we are advocates of evidence-based medicine without actually recognizing this is a very specific paradigm of evidence that entirely discards expert input uh, in order to avoid the, the ghoulish and uh, unwanted uh, possibility of bias or superstition. But in doing so, it means that we're entirely reliant on this hierarchy of EBM, where, wherein randomized control trials are best, but meta studies of those randomized controls are even better. The problem being is that at no point can you actually fully remove the role of human interpretation, aka potential bias. Uh, but what you are doing is you're removing all expertise. You're removing any capacity to ask simple questions of, well, if this was the case, what else would be the case? Uh, as in, we start to introduce prior knowledge. We actually can make use of observations and skills that were sculpted by civilizations that came before us. What have they been doing that's been working so well for them for twelve and a half thousand years? All of that is is actually removed, and what we get is an average for Group A, an average for Group B, with no context. And if there's a statistically significant difference, well, this now works or it doesn't work. And it's such a inappropriate model for studying disease or solutions to those diseases in a group of humans that have developed those diseases over different timescales for different reasons in response to different burdens on the systems, different exposures. But hey, their symptoms kind of sort of look the same. So yeah, let's see how many of this variable group respond to, you know, a histamine blocker. Let's give that a, a, a try and see what happens. Um, and if it's 10%, then well, okay, what does that tell us? <laughs> sure, yes, and not only, but it also removes the humanity from healthcare and from medicine. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, which attracted me to naturopathy was that, um, and also, some of the ancient traditions that, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda. I remember reading about um, um, traditional Chinese medicine doctors would often spend hours and hours with their patients to try to understand uh, them on a far deeper level so that they could suggest something that would be 
um, be effective. And so actually listening, uh, spending time with the person, um, um, understanding uh, their inner world, understanding how they live is not something I can see as being easily replaced by an algorithm or a number on PubMed or, or these sorts of things. While they have their uses, they're um, obviously their tools Absolutely. that we need to use. Uh, really useful part of forming a picture. We can look into PubMed, I can find uh, mechanisms that allow us to frame the question more appropriately. We can see proof of concepts repeatedly so we know how things can play out and it allows us to start building a more rich idea of in what circumstances. If we have two studies that show differing results, something we see all the time for the same exact exposure, well, why is that? And I think that's the the disappointing uh, point right now whereby we're much more likely to see people pick whichever one of those results uh, correlated with their prior held beliefs and decide that the other study was badly conducted and should be ignored. It is not valid rather than looking at, well, why are we seeing the results on one occasion uh, in favor of this intervention? Why are we seeing them uh, against it in another? What's different in either the methodology or in the populations themselves. And what does that tell us about you know, what we need to know? And, and that's where, yeah, integrating prior observations and our, our knowledge that can be extracted from uh, yeah, the more, more ancient healing systems and the ideas that have remained uh, unfalsified throughout hundreds and hundreds of generations, well, that can be a shortcut to getting better context in the way that we use the the quantifiable data which i love by the way uh, but to try to you know extrapolate study equals positive result statistically significant and therefore equals good equals standard of care is just absurd and if we were to apply that, we would expect people to suddenly show a major increase in a whole host of lifestyle diseases, kind of like what we've got now. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, you add in the ideological influences, the industrial influences, and then um, obviously that muddies the waters further. But um, anyway, um, this has been a fascinating uh, talk, Mark. I really uh, appreciate your time. Uh, we're coming up for a, a long episode here. So um, I think we'll, it's, it's a good place to close it. <laughs> it's a good place to close it. We've got through a lot of uh, different information. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak for me today. No worries. Thanks for the chat. <laughs> So that's about all we've got time for today. I hope you found that interesting and useful. As always, please subscribe on YouTube and head on over to the website to join our newsletter to stay updated. See you next time.